Hello, everyone. Hi, Mary. Hi, Molly. How are you? Hi. Doing well. <laughs> Doing well. Great. Great. And I see uh, Barbara and Eliza and Adeb, Sandy, Amanda. Wonderful. I've heard from a number of people who are planning to be here and a number of people who are planning to listen to the recording and I just can't wait. So. <laughs> how Zoom thinks I keep trying to leave the meetings. I want to make sure. Uh-oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Save that. Yeah. Good. Good. So um, I'm going to mute participants except for myself and Mary. And then, uh, folks, when we get around to questions, you can unmute yourself, and I'll repeat this uh, at the top of the hour, but just to keep background noise down. There's a chat function in Zoom. I'm on a Mac. It may look different on a PC, but on my Mac, if I mouse over the bottom of the screen, I see some icons, and toward the center is an icon for chat. And feel free to use that to get my attention. Um, <laughs> What you'll do with my attention, I don't know, but feel free to use it. <laughs> and, <Ditto>. uh, yeah, <laughs> exactly. and if you, um, also when you mouse over the bottom of your screen, uh, there is a uh, icon on the left that allows you to control your audio and video. So you can mute and unmute yourself. You can turn your video on and off and feel free to do that. Um, so cool. Yeah. So a new background to me, Mary. <laughs> You're not in front of a oh. photograph today. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yeah, I turned my chair around a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess that was the Eiffel Tower, wasn't it? Was it was, the, yes. Yeah, such a beautiful structure. My yeah. Goodness. And I kicked one of my cats out of the room because she's like a little kid. You know, when you're on the phone. Yeah. She is just so funny. She'll want to get up on my lap and she'll, you know, knock things over. <laughs> she'll, you know, she'll step, she'll get up on the windowsill next to me and, you know, paw at my clothes. So that's I, right. Mom. I know. I said, honey, you got to go out because that's going to be way too distracting. <laughs> yep. My old cat, uh, Bolivia, used to walk through my videos all the time. So. <laughs> it's just funny how they, I don't know. They just know that you're occupied with something and they, uh, they can't stand it. <laughs> apparently. Yeah. Apparently they want to be the center of attention. Our current cats are, uh, have been with us for just over two years and they were feral when we got them, which mm. my husband wasn't really aware of when he picked them out, but what the heck. <laughs> uh, but they don't do that yet because they haven't decided haven't made a final decision on whether or not we're actually <laughs> central to their existence. I got it. <laughs> got it. Yeah, the one I was mentioning was pretty feral when we got her as well. Mm -hmm. And it took us about like 18 months to sort of calm her down. Yeah. Uh, and so she could be around our older cat. Mm -hmm. So it took a while. It took a while. She's calm most of the time now. She still has some things around food. Yeah, you know, it gets her a little funny mm -hmm. and things like that, but she's generally pretty good. <laughs> I do love them. I find them very entertaining. And early on, Miles said, you know, if, if you're not happy with these guys, because they're our last Bolivia was such a cuddly, friendly, dog-like cat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and he says, you know, we can take her back. And I said, oh, no. <laughs> All I really wanted was something to be the center of my universe. And it doesn't right. really matter to me whether it responds to me as long as I get to obsess about it. <laughs> so, right. And I found that That's I could right. do that without their cooperation. <laughs> so mm -hmm. We have a pretty good time. Oh, let's see who else is here. So hi, Joel. Great to see you here. And Rudy. Or somebody using Rudy's computer. <laughs> hi there. And Sandra. Hey, Sandra. Great to see you. Welcome, everyone. 
Well, we'll get started in just a minute. I, I muted folks just to cut down on background noise, but feel free throughout this conversation, at least after the first couple of minutes, I'm going to give Mary a chance first to introduce herself and tell her story. But feel free when you have questions to either use the chat function or to unmute yourself. So uh, hello, hello. I am Molly Gordon. And there's some new names and faces to me here today. I'm really excited about that. My guest is Mary Schiller. And I had come across Mary's work, uh, Mary's name online on Facebook, as one does, and listened to a couple of her audio, her brief audio podcasts, The Daily Principles, and was impressed. And just, they touched me. And lo and behold, two or three weeks ago, I'm in Laconer, Washington, sitting across from this intelligent, kind of vivacious woman at lunch, and it's Mary Friggin Schiller. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and uh, so we had a conversation, and I learned her story, which I had not learned when I listened to The Daily Principles. And immediately, I knew that I wanted Mary to be a guest on these wholeness hangouts. So the theme of these monthly gatherings, which happen every second Friday at this hour, is the essential wholeness at the heart of every human being. And beyond that, some of the implications of that wholeness, and it's all built on the insights of Sydney Banks. Um, so Mary, welcome. Wow. Thank you. Thank yeah. you, Molly. I really appreciate it. Oh, it's happy so, to be here. So great to have you here. Whoops, I tried to end the meeting again. I got too excited. <laughs> <laughs> Just keep your hands off the keyboard. <laughs> no more touching the keys. Do not multitask. Do not go look at the screen to figure out who your guest is. <laughs> Why don't you tell us, Mary? Tell us your story. Okay, thanks, Molly. So um, I came across the three principles just two years ago. So I'm relatively new to this understanding. And um, I was brought to them really because I was kind of at the end of my rope, <laughs> I guess you could say. I had spent my entire adult life up until that point, I was uh, 52 then, almost 52, uh, struggling with problems stemming from some trauma that I went through in my 20s and my 30s related to my first marriage. And I am kind of embarrassed to say this next part, but um, I saw upwards of 25 therapists during those 30 years. Um, most of them, I actually didn't share anything about my traumatic experience, if you can believe that. Wow. And most of them didn't even pick up on any of it and uh, told me I had other kinds of problems. Like um, I had, some of them thought, you know, I just had general problems with relationships <laughs> or I just had trouble connecting with people or, you know, it just kind of went on and on and on. And it wasn't until uh, several years into all of that, probably about 20 actually, where somebody first pointed out that I probably had symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder and asked me some questions about why that might be. And of course, you know, I started to talk a little bit about my experience with domestic violence in my first marriage and, and then some pieces started to come together for me. So it really took me a long time to put the pieces of that puzzle together, even in just an elemental way. Uh, I just really briefly, uh, I got married when I was 22. I was just out of college. And I married somebody who I hadn't known all that long. Um, it was sort of a 
an impetuous decision as <laughs> can happen when you're that age. And uh, I hadn't had any signals at all that I can remember now or, or saw then that anything was amiss with him or, or with the relationship or anything. Everything seemed fine. And um, literally, we had been married for about uh, seven hours when he turned violent on me. And, um, you know, to say that it was a shock would be <laughs> putting it mildly. I really had no understanding of what happened or why. Um, I was thinking about this this morning. You know, I had no history of being in violent relationships and before then. My family life growing up was calm and normal, no arguing in the house. So it wasn't like I had any sort of exposure to that that would have made me more kind of vulnerable to those situations. And after uh, the initial attack against me happened, I think I just uh, went into survival mode from that moment onward. I think my, my whole system just shifted entirely. My, my physical self, my mental self, everything just went into, I need to stay alive and I need to figure out how to do that. Um, and that was the state of mind that I was in for essentially the next 20 years. Uh, I was married to him for seven, uh, and I had a daughter with him about five years into it, which sort of complicated things uh, majorly because he then began abusing her. Um, I didn't know about it until a little bit later. Um, and even after I left, the marriage, I still had to have a lot of contact with him because we had a child together. And really, I see the abuse as a continual thing that went on until I was about 40 or 41, when eventually, after numerous court uh, situations, a judge finally listened and decided that um, my daughter didn't have to see him anymore. Um, and so therefore I didn't either. By that point, I had been, like I said, dealing with, with him and his behavior and, and all of that for almost 20 years. And in retrospect, I also see that the way the court system treated me and my daughter was also a major contributor to still feeling very vulnerable because um, she wasn't believed, I wasn't believed. It was pretty nightmarish, honestly. <laughs> um, I almost consider that equal to the abuse that he inflicted, to be totally truthful with you. And so by that point, I had gotten remarried and I'm still married to him. Um, but my state of mind was still pretty poor a lot of the time. I had times when I was doing okay, but I never really felt very centered or as if I was really myself. I kind of felt altered in some way. It's kind of hard to explain what I mean by that. Um, but I just didn't feel like myself. And I felt like this new version of myself was something I just had to get used to. And I didn't feel comfortable with that, but it was all that I, I had. And so I spent the next 10 years until uh, 2014 or there about 10 to 12 years, just trying to find ways to feel okay with whatever version of myself there was. <laughs> and it culminated in a 16-month psychotherapy process that I went through in 2011 and 2012 with 
a woman who specialized in helping uh, women who had been through rape and domestic violence and some combination of the two, as I had. Um, she was helpful, except that after I completed that, um, I still felt like something was missing. And I, even though I was feeling better than I had before, I still didn't feel right. I just didn't feel like I had everything. <laughs> and I alternated between feeling like I should just be grateful that I was still alive and that my daughter was still alive and that you know, she had a successful life and that all things considered, I was doing okay. So I sort of alternated between feeling like that and feeling really mad and feeling like I was missing something. Sorry, this is getting a little bit hard. I felt like I was missing something that everybody else got to experience and I didn't. And I felt gypped. I thought, you know, somebody did something to me. I had nothing to do with it. And now my experience of life is forever changed mm. in a way that I can't fix. Because I figured if I hadn't fixed it by then, I was never going to. And I knew I was a reasonably intelligent person and, and all of that. And I just thought, I feel like I've done everything I can do. And so still in the back of my mind somewhere, and I didn't even have a way of connecting with it, I don't think, but somewhere I just still felt like maybe there was something else, like there had to be something. It wasn't like a thought in the front of my mind. It was just sort of something that I felt inside. And so I came across Michael Neal's book, The Inside Out Revolution. And I had no idea what it was about um, when I was introduced to it on a video that I watched. I, I really didn't understand anything that was <laughs> being talked about. It, it sounded sort of like gibberish. Um, but something inside me said, just read it. You know, mm -hmm. what have you got to lose? Just read it. And so I did. I actually, I'm, I'm kind of an audio learner, so I like um, audio books and I started listening to Michael read it, and again, it still sounded a bit like a foreign language, but at the same time, there was some grain of something in there that was reaching me. And I probably listened to that book like five times through, all the way through during the first week or so. I had a fairly lengthy commute to, to and from work every day on the subway, so I used that time to listen, and I would go out for walks on my lunch break, and I'd listen then, and so I had a lot of time. And um, finally, at some point in listening, and then I also was reading it too, the the biggest point that connected with me was this idea that nothing had happened to Mary, like the real Mary, and that all this stuff that went on, all of the, you know, the sexual assault, the choking, the screaming at, the calling horrible names, the throwing around, you know, hurting my child, all of that stuff happened, but it didn't have any effect on me, mm. the real me. And all those years, I thought that the real me was damaged goods. And the, unfortunately, the psychological community essentially confirmed that every time I went for help. And for some reason, when I heard it in Michael's book, I just knew that it was a fact. There wasn't even a question in my mind that what he was saying was true. And that just opened a whole new door for me in terms of 
not just looking at my life going forward, but looking at what I had been through in a very, very different way and seeing that even during all those horrific times, I was fine. And I didn't have to feel badly about it. I didn't have to feel like I'd missed something. I didn't have to... I didn't have to feel that way anymore because it just wasn't true. And I just felt for the first time like I had seen my real self. And she was perfectly okay and more than okay. There was nothing wrong with her at all. Welcome home. Yeah, exactly. I think the next phase of it for me was gaining an understanding of the role of thought also. And it's not like I never figured out that my thinking was causing me problems. <laughs> you know, I, that was fairly obvious, but <laughs> it was more like, you know, I was being told that I needed to do something about my thinking. Yes. And um, that, and that, and I started and I was feeling badly that I couldn't. Right. And with the principles, I saw that, hey, I didn't even have to do anything about it. All I had to do was see what it was doing and that it was there, and that was enough. And the more I just kept looking at thought in that way, the less it caused me any difficulties. Mm -hmm. And people don't believe me when I say this, but this is absolutely true, that you know, I had had daily symptoms of PTSD. Like, I'd be riding on the subway, and obviously it's New York City here, so it's very crowded. And, you know, a guy, if I were sitting down, and a guy was standing, you know, kind of holding onto the pole next to me, I would feel sick. Like, mm -hmm. I would just feel sick to my stomach. And I just noticed one day I was riding the subway to work and I didn't feel that. And I was like, hey, this is new. Like, what's that? <laughs> you know, I didn't have that anxiety all of a sudden. And then I started noticing uh, just within a period of like six to eight weeks, somewhere four to eight weeks, somewhere after reading the book and listening to it, that my kind of daily life started to really change in terms of my comfort level, my physical comfort, comfort level, and my emotional state just started to seem to go up without my doing anything. And I didn't understand what was happening. And I remember having a thought one day, like, just don't worry about it. <laughs> don't try to analyze it because it might go away. No. <laughs> I just kind of let it, you know, <laughs> keep happening. I was like, okay, this is fine. I'm liking this and I'm just right along. Hands off. <laughs> Hands off the wheel. Yeah. And, um, and so once I started to see this for myself in such a dramatic way, I started talking to other people in my life about it. And, um, you know, even at that point, two years ago, very few people even my close friends, even very few of them even knew about my past. Um, and I started to open up a bit more about that and explain how this had helped me with it. And so that's kind of what I've been doing for the last two years is just trying to, you know, talk about what I've seen and hope that, you know, that other people can experience the same kind of impact, whatever their situation is. Obviously, it's universal principles. <laughs> right. right. Well, I'm so struck by a number of things, Mary. Um, the word that's coming to me in this moment is uh, simplicity. 
there's a simplicity about what about your insight and about how it unfolded you know after 25 therapists and some intensive strategies and a lot of work and you're clearly intelligent and articulate and i'm sure you worked your fanny off trying to get past this get over it mm -hmm. and then you see something new and over a period of four to eight weeks that unfolds and it looks like it continues to unfold it's uh I mean, I get it because I've had similar experiences. And at the same time, I'm imagining for some people, they're just going like, holy crap, what, what happened? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a, it's a huge leap. I think that many of us have come to respect and give a lot of significance to diagnoses such as PTSD, anxiety disorder, this, that, or the other thing. Mm -hmm. And to see that there's a potential for a simple insight to free us from identification with that label. Mm -hmm. And as a result, it looks like of being free from that identification, the experience is free to change. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Mind blowing. And I really did uh, identify with that because, um, I don't know how this is going to sound, but I'm just going to say it anyway. And there is a sense when you've uh, been through something like I have that you should hold on to it in a way. Because if you don't, quote unquote, hold on to it, people sort of think that you're uh, excusing the person's behavior or you're absolving them of responsibility or something. And um, even in the domestic violence realm, which I have to say is still pretty uh, covert, <laughs> most of us don't speak publicly about this sort of thing. It's a very hidden group. Um, but within that community, I experienced a lot of um, of conversations with other women that were very much in that realm of not wanting to let go in a way and um, feeling like it was their duty almost to keep it alive. I don't know if that makes sense. It makes perfect sense to me. Mm -hmm. um, in a completely unrelated area, of, I have a lot of uh, care and concern for social justice. And so I've spent a fair amount of time reflecting on the implications of insights such as those we get through the principles for taking action in the world against social justice or so, social injustice. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing about seeing the fundamental wholeness and well being of each person and how thought creates experience that instructs me to stand by and allow racism to be rampant in my community. Mm -hmm. There's no connection there. But there's right. a way in which we've become accustomed to think that worry and uh, indignation mm -hmm. and righteousness are required in order to take effective action in the world. Mm -hmm. And I'm hearing from you that that's not the case. Right, exactly, because what's become very clear to me is that if, if I wanted to be someone who, you know, wanted to effect change in relation to domestic violence, the only way I'm going to be able to do that is from a place of compassion for all parties involved, mm -hmm. not just the people who have been abused, but for the abusers as well. And I can't do that from that other frame of mind. It's not possible. Yeah. Because I walked around, when I say I had anger, I had so much rage inside. I didn't show it on the outside. People would never have suspected that of me because, you know, 
one of the things that people used to say about me, and they still do, but oh, my whole adult life, people would always say, how can you be so calm? You always look so calm and you can handle a lot of things and you never seem to get flustered. And I used to think it's because I learned that from being in this relationship with this person. I couldn't let him see anything. I had to keep everything inside. And um, so I, I can see now that um, my sense of calm that I now exhibit to the world matches what I feel inside. Mm. And it's from that place that I feel like we need to start if we're going to make change, especially in this area. Yeah. And I no longer have that kind of anger inside towards him. Um, I, I realized about a year ago that I couldn't even conjure it up. Like I just, and, and really this used to be like a daily thing that I would get angry inside. You know, something would happen, I'd feel a certain way and I would immediately go into that anger hatred mode. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really been about a year at least since I've had any sort of feelings like that. Um, to the point where, I mean, I haven't seen him since uh, 2001. And I honestly feel like if I saw him today, I probably would have either no reaction, really, or I might, I can't even believe I'm going to say this. I never really thought about it. I might hug him. Wow. I might actually... <laughs> Because I see so clearly now that he was acting he was from his own thinking. He was doing. Was that me? No. I'll get it. There we go. He was acting from his own thinking at the time. He was acting on what looked like he needed to do in order to feel better, in order to feel safe or secure or whatever, you know, and it had nothing to do with me or um, our child or, or anything. It was just all from inside him. And if you look at the, you know, if you think of that consciousness elevator, he was pretty much on the, in the basement. <laughs> And I don't really know how I can fault somebody for that. Yeah. It wasn't like he was there by choice. Yeah, he didn't get up in the morning and think this would be a great idea. No, no. And so um, I don't, you know, getting back to what we were saying a minute ago, I think that if I were to say something like that in a traditional domestic violence kind of setting, I would probably be laughed at or worse. And, um, and yet I still know for a fact that that's the only way we're ever going to fix problems like this. Yeah, there's just no other way. Yeah. I want to invite people, um, if you have questions or comments, there are two ways. You can, uh, if you mouse over the bottom of your screen, you can click on the chat icon and you can send a chat that either goes to everyone or you can even choose me uh, if you want to chat to send it directly and be anonymous. You can also click on the uh, participants icon, and at the bottom of that list, there's a way you can raise your hand. And I will monitor that to see if anybody's got their hands hand raised and would like to say something or ask something. Um, so we'll have those two things in place. 
So Mary, I'm, I remember when we talked about this a bit before, um, you several times, the, this is my version of it, but it sounded yeah. to me like your last therapist got close. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, she was yeah. so almost helpful. Yeah. And she, I wondered if we might talk about that a little bit. Yeah. I, I'll, I'll say a few words about that. So she was close in that she was, um, I think what she was trying to do was show me that there was another way of seeing myself and my experience and that she had hope that I would be able to do that. Mm -hmm. But the piece that was missing was that she still saw me as having a problem. And even though I felt like she really cared about me, uh, she genuinely did. I could tell looking back if she hadn't seen me in that way, if she had seen me as someone without a problem, but just having some thoughts that were causing me some difficulty, that would have just made all the difference. And I wouldn't have seen her for 16 months. It probably would have been more like, you know, six weeks or something. <laughs> so, uh, I, you know, for me, that's, that's been the key in looking back at all of the, the other people that I saw was they all saw me as having a mental illness or if not going even that far, still a problem that needed to be solved. Yeah. And it's ironic because as I'm remembering, and please correct me if I get any of this wrong, she would point out to you that you were doing extraordinarily well in your life mm -hmm. for someone. Who had this right. Experience. Exactly. That's how she would phrase it. She uh -huh. would say, it's amazing to me how well you've done considering, <laughs> yeah. you know, and that just kind of was like, wow, I must be really bad off and just be really good at managing this or something. That's you right. know, I had some really weird thinking around that. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. I see a couple of people. Uh, Deb, I am going to, um, Let's see. Uh, do do do. Why do I do this? I think Deb. I think you can just talk. I think I have unmuted you. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Awesome. Okay. I first of all, I want to thank um, both of you for for doing this, and and I appreciate this. Pretty cool. Um, but Mary, I want to say that. I am grateful that you have brought forth your story like this and that you said that when you saw your, if you were to see your ex-husband, that you would give him a hug because that's a powerful healing, not just for you, but for him, because you're right. He, he probably didn't get up every day and say, I think this is the way I want to be. Mm -mm. Um, and that's, that's really powerful. I, to it come from a domestic violence situation and it took many years but my ex-husband and I are friends now we are we're good friends and he finally and this has been we've been divorced for uh, like 30 years mm -hmm. and he finally apologized to me and I just was like Wow, he said, can you forgive me? And I said, I did. A long time ago, I did. I had to. Mm -hmm. I had the two kids to raise, and, and I couldn't let my anger and bitter and unforgiveness keep me stuck. So mm -hmm. I really applaud you. I really applaud you, and that's something I think that everyone should be able to, to hear and to hopefully move forward with that. Mm -hmm. But thank you so much. Thank you, Deb. That's a, a beautiful story of yours as well. Um, I don't anticipate that I'll probably ever see him again or speak to him again. And so I guess, um, I don't know, in some strange way, I just hope that he can sense this 
from me somehow. I know that sounds really strange, but no, you know, I, I, I don't have the occasion to get in touch with him or, or anything like that. And it wouldn't really be correct of me to do it um, under some circumstances, but I think energetically we all, we, we pass that on. You're sending it. He receives it. Mm -hmm. I hope so. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Deb. And we have another uh, Deborah. Hey, Deborah. I think you're unmuted. Yeah. Barely hear you, Deborah. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, it's somewhat faint. <laughs> okay. Um, I was just uh, going to say that uh, I was in a, uh, a a group room one one time with a professional therapist there sort of uh, holding, um, holding the whole thing together. And I was talking about forgiveness and the importance of it for myself, not, not that I'm under domestic violence, but for the situation I was in, it, the, it was important to, to forgive because if I didn't forgive, as far as I could see, I was only harming myself. Um, and she just, started flapping her hands around her head and arms and flapping around and telling me she was having an ab reaction and then asking uh, everybody else in the room if they also were having an ab reaction and just kind of goading everybody to just sort of make me feel like it was, you know, like I was some kind of weirdo in the room. <laughs> and that was from a professional. Mm -hmm. so, it, so I think it's a battle against a lot more people than you think you're battling against. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hi, Debbie. Good to see you. <laughs> um, you know, the, this last therapist that I saw, we had several discussions about forgiveness. And um, I had told her that I just wasn't able to do it. I didn't understand how to do it. It didn't make sense. And, and she just flat out told me that I shouldn't. Gosh. She flat out told me that I shouldn't. And um, because he didn't deserve it after all of the stuff that he'd done. And what's been interesting is I've thought about forgiveness a lot since this all came out about with the principles and, and how I see things now. And it's funny because I don't really feel like I forgave him exactly. It was just more like I saw him completely differently. Mm. And so there was no conscious act of saying, I forgive him for what he did. It was more like, now I just understand. And that's all I needed to, to see. And I didn't have to understand in a way like, you know, oh, he was acting that way because his father was abusive and blah, blah, blah. You know, I didn't have to go into any kind of analysis like that. It was much, much as you were saying, Molly, simpler than that. Mm -hmm. It was just, I saw the, uh, the underlying system <laughs> and just seeing that was enough to basically erase any feeling like I needed to take some act of forgiveness and move on from that. It just didn't seem necessary. Yeah. Yeah. Something else that struck me when we talked, or maybe it was I listened to a webinar you did for um, the Three Principles Supermind. That's mm -hmm. free on the Three Principles Supermind site for those who might be interested. And what I heard when I listened to that, Mary, was that you um, – I love this because I'm similar. You got the print version, the Kindle version, and the audio <laughs> version. Yeah, all of them. <laughs> yeah. Just and then, kidding me. <laughs> yeah, and then you listened to it repeatedly. Yes. Uh -huh. As you commuted on the subway and walked through the streets of New York City. And the impression I got was that you just, um, first of all, I immediately went out and got the audio because I only had the Kindle. <laughs> But what struck me about it was it sounded to me like you just listened to it. You just opened it up, kind of let it wash over you and did that repeatedly and didn't really work at analyzing it, figuring it out, questioning it, 
and that the whole thing just kind of took care of itself. Yeah, I think that's a pretty accurate description. I don't know if it was just because of the state of mind I was in when mm -hmm. I encountered it or what, but um, I just essentially I applied no intellect to it at all. Because when I would listen to the words themselves, they didn't make sense. Mm -hmm. And so I just didn't listen to the words anymore, <laughs> which sounds really bizarre, but at least in this circle, maybe people understand what I'm saying. I, I just kept listening through them mm -hmm. and listening to what was in Michael's tone. Uh, and not, uh, I just, anytime I kind of felt myself even trying to put two and two together, I just didn't go there. Mm -hmm. It was almost like a reflex. Like every time I would even start to think intellectually about it, I would just go, whoa, no, not going there. No, you know, it just didn't feel appropriate or something. That's so interesting to me because you strike me as a very well-read and thoughtful <laughs> person. And I'm just wondering if that's a usual way for you to encounter new material. <laughs> that's an interesting question. Um, Yeah, probably, actually. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of a, I don't know, I strike myself sometimes as being rather odd because um, I majored in music and then later in English and education, but I'm a complete tech geek. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I write books, but I also love playing with WordPress and, you know, fiddling with, I mean, some kind of this strange combination of things. At least to me, it looks a little strange sometimes. But with this, my uh, my brain just kind of took a vacation, and um, and it felt when it would start to sort of come up, it felt like it was interfering. And I I think it's it's funny too because uh, now looking back, that seems like the best way to encounter this. Mm -hmm. But I didn't know that at the time. It was just more like a natural reflex I seemed to have. Yeah. Yeah. Debbie commented that, that, that she's thinking that may be the key to the rapid results you got. Mm. That be. her intellect maybe got in the way for a while and slowed down for her. Mm -hmm. That could be. Susan, let me unmute you. You mm. are unmuted. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Um, wow, I think Mary, you're being very brave and, and you're sharing, and it's a, you know, it's a great thing to be sharing in this kind of platform. Thank you. And I'm thinking about what you were saying about the forgiveness. Um, Molly, you'll probably remember me. I'm the one with a disability. Yes. So um, that's always something that people have always seen first and foremost where I'm concerned. And yet, um, I'm also an incest survivor. And uh, so that pain has sort of always been something that was hidden. And people would always commend me on how well I did with my disability. And I think, well, you know, that's nothing compared to what was really going on. Mm -hmm. But um, the one thing that I liked about the principal work was the simplicity of the, you know, going with what is innately within you. And the thing that I found difficult as a child, well, obviously I was in a position where the very person that's supposed to take care of you was not, but there was something, there was a knowingness inside me that knew it had nothing to do with me. Mm -hmm. you know, how could it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, um, and that knowingness, I think, saved me. And I really had to struggle as I grew older. And, of course, um, you know, life gets different as you age and mature. But hey, holding on to that knowingness, I really, because um, um, there was not a lot of, um, of conversation about it. And when I did disclose this information with family members when I was an adult, you know, it wasn't welcomed at all. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't disbelieved, but it just wasn't welcomed. Mm -hmm. and so I had to really hold on to that knowingness. Um, and it wasn't until, actually I wrote a book about it, um, 
shadows on the ceiling. And that, in the book, I could see that that knowingness had always been there for me. Mm -hmm. And then that um, allowed me to, um, you know, because there was a side of me that said, well, you know, I love my father. But then there's the other side of me, like, well, that's crazy. Mm -hmm. You know, but I could never not love him. Mm -hmm. You know, because he gave me life, Mm -hmm. if nothing else. Mm -hmm. So knowing, like, just holding on to that, simplicity and not letting all the other you know horror um, and trauma as uh, they like to label Mm -hmm. um, you know distract me and so I've sort of quietly um, been involved with um, I'm the president of a really large women's shelter here in Canada Mm. and I find that when I do talks and meet other women the bitterness mm. that so many people hold on to blinds them, you know, and really um, damages them. Mm-hmm. So, you know, mm-hmm. when I see that and I try my best to, you know, um, encourage a simpler way to see things, it, uh, it saddens me that others don't have that simplicity to just pull away all the noise and go back to your sense of self Mm -hmm. you know yeah um i think that for me i didn't see myself as holding on to anything i saw the feelings of bitterness that you just mentioned and all of that as just part of me Mm. you know people over the years said just let go just let go. And, you know, I wrote a, a memoir of my experience that was pre-principles. Um, and I remember writing a chapter in there and I was like, how can I let go of something that's part of who I am? That's part of myself. My phys- it felt like it was part of my physical self even. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so I couldn't relate to people telling me to just let go of yeah. things. It didn't make any sense to me at all. Well, I think in one sense I was a little... I'm not going to say lucky, <laughs> sounds <laughs> odd, but with having a physical disability, which, you know, nobody aspires to be disabled, um, I learned to befriend and to really love my disability mm-hmm. because it, you know, it enriched me in ways that other people don't experience until it happens to them. Mm-hmm. So I tried to do the same. I tried to bring that same parallel that into my experience with the abuse. And basically the, you know, the shame work, rather, the de-shaming work that I taught and knew a lot about where my disability was concerned, I pulled into the other. So there's a lot of parallels, you know, there's uh, uh, the outwardly people would think, oh, oh, how can you be with that, you know? But um, obviously it was a very difficult experience to grow up in that kind of situation, but... It certainly has taught me a lot about compassion and, you know, um, just a respect of the challenges and how much pain. I mean, I think back and think how much pain he must have been Mm -hmm. to harm the one little person that really loved him, you know. Mm -hmm. So that's very painful. Mm -hmm. And I I think about his pain as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But it's like you're saying, like you felt that bitterness and people would say, well, let go of it. But it's a part of you. So it's it's like if you can befriend the ugly parts of you that are are perceived as ugly, then you can see all the beauty. Yeah, what I saw eventually with the principles was that um, all of that bitterness and anger that I felt had nothing to do with even me. Mm-hmm. It was just transient thinking. Yeah. That was it. And I didn't have to address it. I didn't have to try to let go of it. I didn't have to do anything with it. I could just see what it was, and that was all I needed to do, quote, unquote. It didn't seem like much effort. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you, Susan. Thank you so much, Susan. Um, Deborah posted a couple of questions, but before we go there, I um, have a, a comment. Uh, 
I've worked for years with both abusers and the abused people, including children, in the court system as an advocate within a domestic violence organization and later as a psychotherapist in private practice. And this person is new to the principles. Um, she just wants to observe that not every therapist mm. goes into ab reaction at the name of, at the notion of forgiveness. Right. <laughs> Thank right. You. you know that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And that many therapists mm -hmm. do hold that people are whole and try to bring that presence. Mm -hmm. And then also to drawing the distinction between having compassion for the abuser and condoning or allowing the abusive behavior, that those are entirely separate things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 So let's see, Deborah has two questions and we'll see. Uh, the first one is, Mary, knowing what you do now, what questions would you ask to interview a therapist, counselor, or psychiatrist mm -hmm. to determine if they were a better match? Well, that's a really easy question. I would ask them if there are three principles practitioner. And if they said no, I wouldn't talk to them. That's pretty cut that's and dry. dry. That's pretty cut and dried. Because um, I just don't see any other paradigm working mm -hmm. effectively. Mm -hmm. And without this explicit language that we use with around the principles, I mean, I'm not saying that other people maybe don't take approaches that are similar to mm -hmm. that, but I certainly wouldn't be comfortable unless I knew for sure <laughs> yeah. Yeah. that that was where the person was coming from. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the... Uh, Pivotal points for me in uh, my exploration of the principles was seeing the psychiatrist Bill Pettit, P E T T I T, speak. And I don't remember if this was one of the videos that are on uh, the British Ticken site mm -hmm. or YouTube. I think they're prob it's probably on both. But when Bill talks about innate well being, in his encounters with even people with very serious psychiatric disorders. Mm -hmm. That was so compelling to me. And that's also what's compelling to me about your story, Mary. Um, seeing through thought is a powerful and amazing thing, but it frankly didn't strike me as new. Mm -hmm. um, and I had, you know, I'm always just, when we were in Laconer, I had an experience where, oh, holy crap, it's, it's thought. So it's right. like, oh, yeah. <laughs> and at the same time, it just didn't seem like that big a deal. But when I saw Bill talk about innate well-being and put that understanding together with the principles of mind, consciousness, and thought, that blew the top of my head off. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Yeah. Deborah's second question is, what helped support you on your journey? She says she's got a, a loved one who is suffering, um, and she wants to be the force for knowing that this person is whole, that there's nothing wrong, even though this person hasn't yet seen that. Mm -hmm. What would you recommend for those of us who love and want to be a support to someone who is suffering? <clears throat> I think that uh, looking back on my own experience and the people around me, I think most of them, not all of them, but most of them who knew about my uh, violent situation before were, they somehow continued to see through it in a way that I couldn't. They continued to see through my behavior and my weirdness <laughs> at times and were just able to um, not care so much about the way I was acting. They didn't react to me like there was something wrong with me. Sometimes they did, but most of the time they didn't. Mm -hmm. And I think now um, if I were with somebody who was who is like that, I really think the best thing 
we can do for them is to really truly come from that place of knowing that they are fine and even if they don't look fine even if they don't act fine even if they're suffering to not worry that they're in that state and that's a really hard thing to do i think is to not worry about someone who's in that state but that was something that came up for myself too is i saw that i didn't have to worry about myself anymore cuz i was worried mm -hmm. that was another piece of this was you know i i worried about the damage i'd done to myself you know physically and mentally and every other way i thought you know this uh, another therapist told me I'd probably shortened my life from, by several years from all the stress I'd been under, you know, so I had all that kind of piled on top of it. And when I understood what the principles were saying, I saw that I didn't even have to worry about that anymore, that that was just not necessary. There was nothing to worry about because I was fine. And so if there's a way for you Deborah, to, to see this person from that place really genuinely that there isn't anything wrong with them. There's nothing for you to even be concerned about that I really believe that they will feel that even if nothing is even spoken about it because chances are, depending on what the person's state of mind is, they might not hear that the right way. But if the energy from you is is connecting with them, mm -hmm. I'm sure that that would make a difference. Yeah. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. You, um, I'd love for people to be able to follow up with you, know more about you. There's a link on the page from which people got here to your website. Mm -hmm. But tell them more because you wrote a really rather marvelous little book. <laughs> Thanks, Molly. Yeah, so on my site, thedailyprinciples.com, I have a, a little ebook there called The Joy Formula. And I actually just finished turning it into a real book. <laughs> so pretty soon I have to take it down as a freebie because when you put it up on Amazon, they get very angry if you have it free somewhere. <laughs> so um, I'm going to put it online as both a paperback and a Kindle book. Um, shortly like within the next two or three days but uh, right now you can still go to the daily principles.com and, and download it and it was really just my way of expressing what I'd seen I had I think I mentioned a few minutes ago that I'd written the memoir of my experience in that marriage and I had thought about writing like a sequel or um, maybe uh, an addendum or something to that um, and I didn't publish that one under my real name I used a pseudonym because I was a little nervous about that and then one day I was like you know I don't need to do that I'm just gonna start over I'm just gonna start something and and just describe what I have seen and really what came up when I started writing it was I realized very um, it was pretty powerful that I realized that all of the happiness that I thought other people had that I wasn't able to have because of what had happened to me, that I was actually made of that and that I couldn't run away from it if I tried. And I just realized that because I had been walking around with this misunderstanding all these years, I didn't realize it. Yeah. And so I just came up with this little equation about, you know, joy equals you minus a misunderstanding mm -hmm. and um that's what i based this little book on it's really lovely and it happens that i listened to it because you oh, you also, did. <laughs> at least for a while it's on soundcloud there. for another day or two <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm gonna offer the audio version again too uh separately but yeah, yeah it's, still there. <laughs> it's really beautiful and i'm kind of an elitist uh snob when it comes to writing <laughs> So take it from me. This is a good book. <laughs> if you want to trust an elitist snob. Oh, thanks. Oh, Mary, thank you so much. Um, 
I encourage anyone who's listening to go to the da the daily principles. Is it? Yeah. The daily principles.com. Yep. yep. And I have an experience of Mary and her brief daily podcasts and download that ebook. So thank you everyone for participating today. Have a wonderful rest of the day and weekend. Bye-bye. Thank all. you, Molly. I appreciate it. Thanks yeah. everybody.